Boko Haram terrorizes northern Nigeria. On Saturday, the group killed more than 100 civilians in the northeast. It's one of the most violent attacks in years. What's been done to fight Boko Haram and can it be defeated? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Bernard Smith. Nigeria's government has repeatedly said it has defeated Boko Haram. Yet after more than 10 years of fighting the armed group, violence is on the rise in the northeast. Boko Haram is suspected of being behind an attack on Saturday that's described as the most violent on civilians this year. The UN says at least 110 people were killed in an assault on farmers in rice fields near Borno's state capital, Maiduguri. Ahmed Idris reports from the Nigerian capital, Abuja. They travelled more than a thousand kilometres to find jobs in one of the most dangerous places to live and work in Nigeria. They ended up in the hands of Boko Haram, bound and then slaughtered. 43 victims laid to rest in the cemetery. I've never seen anything like this in my life. You can see 43 dead bodies here. Up to now, there are some bodies that are yet to be recovered from the bush. Indeed, it is a frightening situation. A search is being carried out for dozens of others who are missing, but most are presumed dead. Six survivors are being treated in hospital for serious injuries. The state governor is turning to local vigilante groups for help. We shall ensure more recruitment of civilian JTF and more hunters so that our people will take the fight to all the nooks and crannies of this area. The farm workers were contracted to harvest crops some 25 kilometers away from the city of Maiduguri. The manner they were killed suggests the attackers were careful not to attract attention. Last month, the armed group killed 22 farmers in two separate attacks outside the regional capital Maiduguri. The president has issued a statement condemning the recent attack. But after a decade of such raids by Boko Haram and the ongoing ethnic violence, kidnappings and robberies, many Nigerians say the government is not doing enough to protect them. The United Nations resident representative issued a statement condemning the attack, saying many women had also been abducted. An estimated 36,000 Nigerians have been killed by Boko Haram over the past 11 years, and more than 2.5 million have been displaced. Security forces are obviously losing this war, and this particular attack and others we have seen in the last eight months or so were attacks, were attacks that are the product of the security forces' own strategy. Uh, last year, which is 2019, was the deadliest year for security forces in Nigeria since the Boko Haram war started. For many years, the Nigerian government had been claiming victory over Boko Haram, but the armed group continues to attack both civilian and military targets with devastating results. This latest is one of the worst since the start of the Boko Haram insurgency that was launched 12 years ago and has now spread to neighboring Chad, Cameroon and Niger where thousands of civilians and security personnel have been killed. Ahmed Idris, Al Jazeera, Abuja. Boko Haram under its leader Abu Bakr Shekau rejects Western influence and secular education. The group calls for Islamic rule and launched an armed campaign in 2009 that was suppressed by security forces. But nearly a year later, Boko Haram re-emerged, carrying out attacks from its stronghold in northeastern Nigeria. The kidnapping of 276 girls from their school in 2014 drew international attention to the ongoing threat from Boko Haram. The group pledged allegiance to ISIL in 2015, but 12 months later, some senior Boko Haram members broke away, creating the Islamic State West Africa province. Let's bring in our guests. In Abuja, we have Ovigwe Agwegu, a geopolitical and security analyst at the think tank AfriPolitika. And joining us from Paris is Vincent Foucher, a consulting senior analyst for West Africa at the International Crisis Group. Welcome to you both, uh, gentlemen. I'll start with you, Ovigwe, if I may. Just try and help us understand Boko Haram a little bit. What is 
their motivation. It's a very, they have a very narrow concept of what they consider to be a true Muslim. They attack Islamic institutions more often than Christian. Most of their attacks against civilian targets, markets, bus stops, IDP camps. What is their, what is their raison d'etre? Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Now, Boko Haram, I mean, it's in the name. It means rejecting Western education. Now, Western education is, is forbidden. And so uh, their, their primary uh, aim is to do away with everything in Nigeria, you know, at least based on where they're operating, that they see as, you know, uh, against their belief, which is really, which is really uh, led to somewhat violence down the years. So uh, uh, in the last decade or so, just over, over a decade now, that's how much, you know, they've been, how long they've been operating. And m their victims have primarily been more m Muslims than, than even Christians. Yeah, they've bombed a few churches, you know, carried out a few attacks against Christians, but majority of the time, the victims of, you know, Boko Haram attacks, you know, have been Muslim. We're looking at about over 30,000 killed since 2009 and about 2 million displaced. So it has been a brutal, you know, uh, insurgence in the northeast of Nigeria, particularly in Yobe, Yobe State, Borno State, you know, and Adamawa, and also extending across the border, you know, to parts of uh, Niger Republic, where Nigeria borders Niger, you know, the Lake Chad Basin countries, you know, like um, Chad, uh, Republic, uh, Chad Republic and uh, Cameroon. So all of these countries have, for the last, you know, a little over a decade, been in suffering incessant attacks of Boko Haram. And the recent attack we just saw, yeah. you know, is just, it's just a continuation of what, what has been happening. And okay. recently, the Global Terrorism Index just ranked Nigeria as the third most terrorized yeah. country in the world. And that's no thanks, you know, to Boko Haram. OK. And, and Vincent, Abu Bakr Shekau is the leader of the group. Just tell me a little bit about him. And is it all, is the extraordinary brutality that they use really all down to him? It's all under his direction. He's in total control of them. Well, actually, it's important to, uh, to take notice of the fact that in 2016, there was a divide uh, yes. within the group. And now we have two different factions with very different agenda, with very different attitudes towards a variety of forms of violence. Um, the, the, the group, actually, that is the one which is affiliated to the Islamic State, uh, which is critical of Shekau's uh, really extreme form of, uh, of, um, of violence, you know, the, this, this notion of takfir, that you excommunicate people, that everyone who is not with you, basically, is against you and is a legitimate target, even if he's a civilian, if he, even if he's a child. Um, that is Shekau's policy. The other group, the ISWAP, um, as, a, as, a, as a very uh, different approach, and for instance, they ban, um, they ban the use of suicide bombings against, uh, against mosques or markets. Uh, they do not use uh, child soldiers. So they, 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 are, um, they, they, they have uh, rethought and changed and, and, and evolved um, from, from Chicago's model, uh, realizing that it came with limitations. Um, oh. It's not that they are nice, uh, but they are different. <laughs> OK, well, now you've mentioned them. Let's, let's talk about ISWAP, Islamic State, West Africa province, uh, Vincent. I, who is the greater threat at the moment in that part of the world? Is it the Islamic State or is it Boko Haram? I think there's no doubt that ISWAP is the largest, larger threat now. Um, if you see, um, you know, since 2017, uh, the, the, largest, the largest attacks on, on military, the most successful attack on on the military, especially in Nigeria, but also in Chad, um, have been, um, uh, um, you know, carried out by ISWAP, uh, partly because ISWAP has, has rethought uh, tactics. And also they have learned, uh, thanks to the Islamic State, they have adapted, uh, they have evolved, they are much more astute, they are um, organized, um, you know, they are, their organization has evolved, they have a, a permanent um, a troop of soldiers, uh, rather than the, the militia kind of system that Shekau um, used to work on. So they, they, they have clearly uh, have, have had the most impact on the ground. Of the way, do you see that? Do you see the Islamic State as a, as a, as a greater threat or is Boko Haram just as threatening? No, I agree with, with, with the other guest there. ISWAP represents a, uh, a, it's a greater threat because its threat is broader in terms of geographic, you know, area. So you would find Boko Haram attacks are mostly in northeast Nigeria, particularly in Borno. And they are insurgent, they, they have, uh, they apply more of guerrilla tactics, so they just 
hit and run, hit and, and, and run, similar to uh, eSwap, quite all right. But, uh, but if you look at how eSwap has been able to attack Niger Republic, you know, and also see coordinate attacks in Burkina Faso, you know, and uh, uh, some parts of, of Mali. So there, there's, a, a, there's a tri-border area, you know, between Burkina Faso, Niger, you know, uh, and Mali, where they really have, you know, uh, be very successful, you know, in the attacks, troop attacks against the Niger Republic last year, almost a hundred, you know. So it's, they definitely have been more, uh, more impact. But, but, but in the last two years, they reminded us of what Boko Haram used to be in 2014. So uh, I would say, you know, Boko Haram has really been reduced in terms of our capacity to, you know, carry out attacks. Uh, but just as we, uh, Boko Haram has been, been going down, you know, ISWAP has, you know, uh, built capacity. And I think in, in no part, so the new, new leadership of ISWAP, you know, uh, I think Abubakar Banawi or so, you know, his leadership, just like the other guest was mentioned, is, takes a different approach. And that appeals more to, you know, jihadists who feel they shouldn't be targeting Muslims, at least in a very gruesome manner, like, uh, Abu, uh, like Abu Bakr Shekau is, is doing. So that difference in approach, as he has been able to win more, you know, combatants and then leverage on that, you know, on that um, popularity, you know, to, uh, you know, to carry out more, more attacks. So, so what you would find now is, you know, the uh, ISWAP is really giving the G5 Sahel countries, that's the coalition countries, you know, uh, in West Africa fight, you know, fighting, you know, uh, Islamic insurgency and other organized crimes like human trafficking and drug, drug trafficking, they, they really be giving them headache, uh, as opposed to Boko Haram that is really more of a Nigeria and, uh, you know, child uh, problem. So uh, to a large extent, I feel, you know, it's, it's not as if one, like the other guys, uh, guess here says, it's not as if one is better than the other, but the, cap the difference in their tactics and model and approach to, to what they are doing has made ISWAP more of a greater and far broader threat, you know, than Boko, Boko Haram in recent years. And Ovikwe, why have the Nigerian security forces, the army, so struggled against Boko Haram and Islamic State? Why have they not been able to bring this under control? Well, yes, yeah. So initially, it was it, it was an issue of uh, capacity. So. Prior to Boko Haram, the Nigerian, government, Nigerian military and even the government had no experience combating, you know, uh, is, militant Islamic groups, right? So just uh, just a, a few years after, you could see by 2010, 2011, when the bombings and the attacks started, you know, there was this, uh, I would say, very slow reaction to understanding how deep a threat this was. And then you see by 2013, 2014, the attacks got really, really massive. And it blew on, on our faces when, you know, there was that, that Chibok incident when, you know, uh, young girls were, over 200 girls were taken, you know, from school. So if you see wh why the go what the government, uh, why, why the government started building capacity, acquiring weapons, which they hadn't done for many years, and weapons that actually fit into the theater or, uh, and the threat that yeah. they face, you, uh, you could see that they, they, they started making gains, you know, because when they declared their caliphate, you know, that was, that, that was even the height of, you know, the case. So that territorial threat, you know, was something new that the government hasn't seen in a while. So when, by the time they mobilized the military, acquired new weapons, you know, and started, you know, testing strategies, yeah. you know, you could see they started making progress. But you recall, in, between 2018 to 2000 and early 2019, there was a massive, you know, increase in fatalities in the Nigerian army. So in early, 2019 was the deadliest year so far. You know, so especially early part of 2019. So later in the year, the army, you know, uh, and that was because, you know, using numerical strength, insurgents are able to actually overrun small troop locations. So what the army used to do is that they would just set up camps and, some, and bases around the region, the, the northeast uh -huh. region. But by using their numerical strength, they were able to overrun these bases and these troops, which led to an upsurge in fatality. So okay. later in the year, later in the year, you could see that the army decided to change its strategy and to concentrate fighting uh, forces okay. in stronghold called super camp. So that super camp strategy, you know, came on board uh, last year. Yeah. And and since then, you could see that there's been a decrease in troop fatalities. But okay. there's also be an unintended consequence. 
you know, the unintended consequence is that we now have community, communities in the hinterlands that no longer have direct protection from the, from the army. And okay. that has made it very easy for such attacks on farmlands, you know, to, to, to happen. OK. I've, I've, uh, uh, and, Vincent, the Nigerian army's reputation hasn't helped, has it? Amnesty's documented extrajudicial killings, deaths in custody and lawful detention. Does that play into Boko and the Islamic State's hands? Well, this, uh, you know, abuse by security forces actually stands at the very origin of Boko Haram. In 2009, uh, after Mohamed Yusuf, the founder of the group, was captured uh, after an uprising in Maiduguri, he was, he was, um, the army captured him and, and, and gave him to, to the police. And the police basically executed him. And, and probably we would be in a different place uh, now if Mohamed Yusuf was, was alive and in detention. You know, maybe he would have been in a position to, 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 to make take steps for negotiations, you know, and 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 the sense of of, of abuse uh, that uh, that many people have in the northeast, the sense that they are not well treated by uh, by the military, um, the sense that uh, sometimes they are safer, they feel safer uh, staying with Iswap or, or with um, uh, Jas Boko Haram uh, than, than you know uh, hanging around the military or living under military control. That is a very serious problem, you know, because it cuts to the, the heart of the thing. It's a governance issue. OK. And, Ovigwe, uh, Vincent just touched on it there, but I wanted to ask about the circumstances of people in that part of Nigeria that helps Boko Haram and Islamic State swell their ranks. What is it that they are drawing on? I'm reading about the al Majiri, these millions of children who are begging on the streets in North African... in, in Nigeria's northern cities, eight and a half million of them there, how are they sucked into Boko Haram and Islamic State? Is it solely religion? Oh no, it's not. It's not. It's, it's a far broader issue than just religious, you know, and uh, religious and ideological uh, issue. So there are real socio-economic and political, you know, uh, context that is needed to understand, you know, how the proliferation of Boko Haram. Boko Haram. For instance, Nigeria has over 11 million children out of school, right? And then you also look at the, the fact that, you know, according to the, to the WHO, there are 80% of the 90 million people in Nigeria living in abject poverty are in the northern part of Nigeria. So the failure of governance to actually ensure that youths are at least, uh, young children are educated and to, be, to become, you know, uh, well-meaning adults, it, it's, it's not there. Then you also have, you know, environmental issues also as well. For instance, the Lake Chad has been shrinking for decades, yeah. and not not much has been done to ad to address that. And Lake Chad being a major body of water that the agricultural and farming communities actually use for it for irrigation. So when you look at the dynamics of increased, you know, poverty, you know, uh, and you know, environmental factors that that are preventing. You know, and desertification as well, okay. you know, preventing, you know, these farming communities or these communities that are predominantly farming communities yeah. to carry out, you know, their activities and earn a living, you get a population that, that is, it would say, disenfranchised. And okay. that, they, they become, like, a, a easy to be exploited, you know, exploited right. by these groups to spread their ideologies. OK. And, Vincent, how much of their support, then, for Islamic State, for Boko Haram, is sympathy or how much of it is drawn just from blind fear or these economic pressures uh, that Ovigwe describes? I think it's a complex mix. I think there were, you know, the, the, Boko, the movement before 2009, there was a real mass movement of people who were thinking that, that you know, the Sharia and, you know, Islam implemented in daily life um, could, could, could be a serious improvement uh, in terms of governance, in terms of justice. That is, you know, that is what they talk about, the defectors. When you speak to them, they explain that we joined to do justice. You know, we thought we would make the world a better place. Um, um, so that's certainly part of the story. And then, especially under Shekau, Shekau, he captured lots of people. And he, he sort of forced them to join, enlisted them by force, you know, under penalty of death. Um, and also, uh, they started at some point recruiting in the neighboring countries uh, with promises of money, of promises of of a good wedding or business opportunities. 
And that was also uh, there. And then you have people who joined out of fear. You know, um, there was a very famous episode in 2014, um, an, an escape uh, from, from Giwa Barak's military prison in Maiduguri. And, and lots of people who were there who had never been associated with Boko Haram. When Boko Haram attacked the jail, they felt it was, you know, because the conditions in the jail were so bad and, and the perspective of obtaining justice from the Nigerian state was so remote. They just felt that following um, the, the, the attackers of the prison on the way out uh, was the best way to survive. So it's a mix and, and you have to address this mix. OK, and Vincent, I wanted to ask you about the multinational joint task force that's operating up there, Nigeria, Cameroon and, and Chad. How, how effective is that or is there a need for something broader? Is there some way that should the US be bothered about what's happening there in terms of the threat to oil interests? Is there a need for some sort of force like that that defeated ISIL in Iraq? Is there a need for a new look up there? That, I mean, there's a lot of question there. Um, <laughs> the, I mean, clearly, um, the fact that the, 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 the main combat area stands at the border between four countries is very important because it allows, you no know, borders are very good for insurgents and rebels because they can cross you can cross the border and, and move into a country which, you know, doesn't have the same pressure or interest in, in, in checking their activities. They can, they can sell, they can buy, they can recruit people, like I explained. So the borders are, are a very important aspect of the conflict. And, and President, uh, the, you know, until President Buhari, the Nigerian presidents were, were not very committed, actually, to reaching out to the neighbors and building, a, you know, a sort of consensus and, and collaboration. There was a lot of uh, bad feeling, especially between Nigeria and Cameroon. Um, but President Buhari, to his credit, has actually um, made efforts to reach out in 2015 when he, when, when he took over. And that, that has had some effect. Uh, but, I, I, you know, I, I still think it's lagging. And, and, and partly because the other states feel that the Nigerian authorities are not doing enough, you know, are not doing their share. Um, and Chadian troops um, came into Nigeria um, twice already to fight along with Nigerian troops. Um, and, 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 you know, they, they just pulled out every time feeling that, uh, yeah, you know, we come, we push the rebels away, but then the state, the Nigerian state doesn't deploy, doesn't, doesn't keep the ground that we've conquered. So, you know, there, there's, there's all sorts of um, frustrations and hard feelings there. Uh, but, you know, the, the collaboration is still there and, and uh, it, is, it is an indispensable uh, ingredient, definitely. Ovigwe, would should there be some sort of international coalition like that that defeated or pushed out ISIL from uh, Iraq in northern Nigeria, a similar sort of thing, international involvement, or is the multinational uh, joint task force, the regional one, the effective tool? Yeah, I think that there already is an international, you know, uh, pr platform in place. For instance, uh, you've got the G5 Sahel, which France is a huge, you know, proponent of. And then in the child countries, the child basin countries, we've got the multinational multi uh, joint task force, so which is made up of, you know, by, uh, three countries. And what we, what is needed, actually, is these countries need to be supported. The regional armies need to be supported you know, with, you know, capacity building exercises, you know, with uh, weapons to actually fight the insurgency, not necessarily bringing in foreign troops. I mean, these countries already have their own armies, right? So, for, for instance, the, U, the U.S. carries out a, a training exercise, you know, called Operation Flintlock. They even had one earlier this year, I think in February. So there, there, is, there is definitely there's definitely U.S. commitment in the sense they've got you know U.S. Air Force base you know uh, in Agadez, you know uh, they are they are uh, French uh, bases also in 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 the, in the countries in Niger I think so there already is a foreign presence who, so and I, but I think what I'm in, what you are mentioning now is if this country would deploy boots on the ground again there are already boots on the ground. Uh, but m maybe in special forces operation, for instance, the U.S. Marines actually just came in not too long ago to rescue an American who was, yeah. you know, who was uh, kidnapped by, by ban bandits in Nigeria. So um, we don't necessarily need anybody, to, uh, any one country or country to form, like, form a coalition to come fight because there is already one on the ground. Okay. What is needed is to for the international community to support what's on the ground. Okay, Whether by providing uh, weapons, by uh, in, increasing training. 
We're and out of all of that. All right. But we're, I'm so sorry. We're, we're right out of time. So much to talk about. But thank you to Ovigwe Aguegu and to Vincent Forcher. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. We are at AJ Inside Story. From me, Bernard Smith, and the whole team here, bye for now.